Um, just started the recording and I'm going to share my screen. Hold on, let me close a couple windows. Okay, so we should be good. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen. And there we go. Um, don't worry about that. So tonight we are talking about loops. Um, so what is a loop? Let's start off with just generally, why in the world do I want this thing called a loop? Well, a loop is very handy. What I use a loop for, and I use them all the time, is because I need to do the same thing multiple times, and I don't know how many times I'm going to do that in the beginning. Potentially, I won't know until somebody puts something in while I'm inside the loop. So a loop is about repeating yourself again and again and again in a way that allows someone to, con okay, sorry, it's been a long day at work. A loop is about doing the same set of actions again and again and again with most of the time a way to control the loop so you can end it safely. Um, so that's what a loop is. And loops are very important in programming because they, um, they allow you to reuse code. And this is our first foray into reusability. And what I mean by reusability is maybe I have five lines of code and I'm going to use that five lines of code a thousand times. Well, I don't want to write that same, those same five lines a thousand times. I don't want 5,000 lines of code if I don't need 5,000 lines of code. So if I can find a way to reuse those five lines of code a thousand times, a hundred times, however many times I need, I have significantly reduced the amount of code that I have to write and maintain, and I have um, improved the potential quality because I've got less that I have to do later on. You know, if my code breaks and I've got to read through 5,000 lines of code, that's a lot of work. If my code breaks and I have to read through five lines of code, that's a whole lot less work. So reusability is very, very important. It goes to effort and it goes to quality. Um, and so looping is the first foray into that methodology, into reusability. Actually, let me make this bigger. There we go. So let's see. There are two kinds of loops in Python. There are while loops and there are for loops. While is you're doing something um, that may not necessarily have a distinct end. So oftentimes, and this goes to your project, you will want to use a while loop if you're asking somebody to enter information into the loop which will decide whether or not you keep going or you exit the loop. So that's what while loops are used for quite a lot. Now you don't only have to use them for that, but I use for loops more than I use while loops. And that's because oftentimes I, I can bound when a loop starts and when a loop finishes. If I'm not absolutely sure when the loop is going to finish, like because there's an input statement in there that a user um, is going to give me input, then I use a while loop. So there are two kinds of loops, and they both have their syntax. Now, one thing that's important is that all of the stuff we learned last week about branching and decisions, we're going to put into play this week, but with loops, because loops are like if statements in that they don't know a lot. You're going to, a, a, a while loop or for loop is basically asking the same kind of question we did with if statements last week. 
And so we have to write them similarly. So you still have to be thinking in that branching and looping, sorry, the branching, uh, you know, how we were thinking last week with branching, and we're going to apply that to loops this week. So they're not two distinct things. There's a reason we did branching last week and we're doing looping this week. So let us go down, talk a little bit more about while loops. Okay, so what is a while loop? Well, it repeatedly executes a block of code. Just like last week when we had the block of code for an if stick for if, we're going to have um, I don't, let me do this, new Python file, file. So a while, <coughs> excuse me, um, I can write a really simple while loop. First of all, oops, hold on, let me get that out of the way. Add configuration, sorry, I have to do this, Python. Come on. Module 4. One. Open. Add an interpreter. And we're good. Okay. So I'm going to write a very simple while loop here. I just added the Python configuration. Ugh. I do not like this new version of PyCharm. It really does make things very, very irritating. Okay, so let's see if we need to do this again. Python. I should not have to. Okay, so I want to write my first while loop. And let's just see what happens. I'm going to say while, first of all, well, let me do it this way. While stop equal go, sorry, equal equal go, um, actually let me do this, not equal quit. What's here? Okay, so first things first, I have two red lines over here. Why do I have two red lines? Because you're going to run into this when you start writing loops. I have this thing here called stop. Well, what is that? Stop is supposed to be a variable, but it is not currently defined because I haven't defined it. There's nothing where stop is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. So. I just wanted to do this on purpose to show you that when you're starting to write while loops and for loops, if you're getting these, you know, unresolved reference to stop or why aren't you letting me run? Whoops. Run. Okay, so if you run it, let me make this a little bigger. There we go. No, it's not helping. If you run it and you get syntax error, invalid syntax, and you're saying, oops, wait a minute, sorry, that should have been a colon, not a semicolon. It's because me and Java today. Okay, so this is the error that I wanted you to see. My apologies. Um, if you see name error, name stop is not defined. That is because name stop isn't defined. It is supposed to be a variable. So that in that position, there's supposed to be a variable. It's not a variable because I haven't defined it. So I have to define stop equal go. Okay? So now if I run it, I get type quit to stop. 
and I type go, and I type go, and I type quit, and I stop. So what just happened? Well, what just happened is that I ran something in a loop. And you can see here that the loop kept going until I gave it the magic word, which was quit. Um, so let's take a little bit closer look, and I'll make this bigger, so we can see what happened here. I'm going to hit a breakpoint, and I'm going to debug this. So the first thing I do is I'm at the console, and I hit this line, line 4. Line 4 has the keyword while. It has the variable stop. And what am I doing here? I'm saying not equal to the word quit. So what I'm really saying to Python is the word, sorry, the value of the variable stop is not the same as Q-U-I-T, true or false. At this point, stop is equal to go, because that's what I set it to. So I'm all, the first time I'm in, I get, get to this line of code, Python is going to say, oh, that's a false. If this is a false, I'm sorry, Python is going to say, this is true, because stop is not the same as quit. Stop is go. So this is true. If it is true, then I will go in and I will do the line that's in the body of the loop. So let me step over. I am now in the body of the loop. Okay? So when I step over again, it's going to say type quit to stop. I'm going to type go. And I make it to line four again. You'll notice I didn't go to a line six. I didn't stop. The program did not stop. That's because the purpose of this loop is to keep going until I tell it to quit. So I'm going to step over my while again. My while is going to say, okay, stop is not equal to quit, so I'm going to keep going. Oops. My bad. All right, so I'm here. It's going to ask for input, and I'm going to type in today is Monday. Now you will see here that it says stop is today is Monday because stop is whatever this input is. And I'm going to, I come up to the while loop and it's still not the word quit. So I'm going to do it one more time. And now I do want to stop. So I'm going to type in what it tells me. I'm going to type in quit. And when I quit, I come up to the loop again. What is stop? Well, if I look in the debugger, stop is now quit. And is quit the same as quit? Yes, it is. So I'm going to step over this, and the program ends. So that is what happens with a while loop. Now, this becomes important because you're going to use this. You're going to use this in your, prog in, in your game program, and there's another project with which you're going to use this. So get familiar with while loops, and as the next couple weeks go on, we can start talking about what it takes and what we're learning that specifically applies to your programs. So, and by the way, as always, stop and ask any questions if you guys need to. So that's what a while loop is. Um, and, yeah. That's just a lot of fancy print stuff. So we just stepped through a while loop, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, that I like PyCharm, because when you're doing something like looping, um, and you're not exactly sure what's happening, if you run it in the debugger in PyCharm, you can look at what's happening on every single um, line. Now, there's something here to watch out for. And it's called an infinite loop. And that's because you can create loops that never stop. Now, Zybooks will give you a, will give you a timed out error. I'm not going to do one on here on my computer because I don't want it to chew up all the processing. 
So Zybox will basically say, okay, something's wrong here, and stop. Not all of, like PyCharm won't do that. So you have to be very careful of these infinite loops. Um, and anyway, so that's just something to watch out for. If you're running like your program in PyCharm and you're trying and things just aren't stopping, you may simply have an infinite loop and it can take a little bit to quit them. Um, so let's see. Um, so we, j I just, you know, this is challenge 4.2.2, a basic while loop with user input. And that's pretty much what I did. Um, so I'm not going to do that one. And this is write a while loop that prints user num divided by 2 until the user num is less than 1. The value of user num changes inside the loop. Okay. Ten five two. Okay. I see what they're doing. By the way, if you guys want me to go through any particular challenge or any particular lab, let me know and we'll make the time to do that. I know last week we went until about 1030 and I'll try and not to do that this time. Um, these are more while loop examples. The nice thing about this is you can see you can use if else elif statements inside loops. So you can have a while loop with branching inside of it. You can have a branch with a loop inside of it. You can have loops with loops inside of it. And those loops with loops inside of it are going to become more important next week when we start talking about lists because um, we're going to have two-dimensional lists. And to do a two-dimensional list, you're going to have to have a loop inside of a loop. Um, so, uh, getting input. Okay, so we know how to get input. And let me go down. Bidding. Write an expression that continues to bid until the user enters in. So we basically did that in our while. Um, uh, counting. Okay, so counting, whoops, my bad. I don't know what's going on here. Counting is important um, because you have to know how to um, change the variable associated with the loop value. So what do I mean by that? In this example, we just use user input to tell us to stop or go. Okay? But that's not always the way that things are going to work in a loop. Now, if there's counting to be done, I usually do it in a for loop, but I will show you how to do it in a while loop as well. So I'm going to create a new file. Come on. File. New. Thank you. Python file. Out. Okay. And edit configuration. I still don't know why I have to do this. Okay. So what are we talking about now? We are talking about iterating. We're talking about having a number that changes inside the loop that is in fact controlling what happens with that loop. So when we're talking, this is what we're talking about here. And in this case, we have i equal 1, while i less than or equal to n, loop body statements go here. So then you loop it. So let's see what happens when I do this um, in my program. So I'm going to say n is 10. And I'm going to say uh, counter is 0. I'm going to say while counter is less than or equal to n colon print counter
and then I'm going to say counter equals counter plus one. So what am I doing here? I'm trying to type the word, the number one. So what I am doing here is basically instead of having user input control the loop, I'm having a, an, an algorithm um, determine when the loop stops. And this is just a simple algorithm. I'm adding one to the counter. So let's run this and see what happens. So I started out at zero, and I ended up at 10, which is what I would have expected, because I said counter is zero, so counter is going to start at zero. And actually, let's walk through this in the debugger, and I think it will make it clearer. OK. So I'm here in the debugger, and it's just waiting for the connection right now. So I'm here on this line. And on this line, I can see that counter is zero, and n is 10. So what I have to do here is what Python's going to do, and it's going to say counter, so 0 is less than or equal to 10, true or false. That's true. Since it is true, what Python is going to do is it's going to go to line 7. Line 7 is just going to print out what I want it to print out, and then line 8 is going to alter counter. So we'll see right here counter is 0. When I do counter equal counter plus 1, counter changes to 1. That's, Chris, that's just kind of the way I, that this is flavor versus function. You don't have to have the format there, but I'm old school, so <laughs> that's what I do. You don't have to do it like that, but that's what I do. You could just put counter is plus counter. Yes, I could. And again, sometimes old habits die hard, and these are my old habits. So um, there's all these great new formatters in Python. And um, I was writing Python code yesterday, and I'm sure that some of my, my colleagues who love to get the newest and greatest things would have been like, Oh, okay, but then they see my old programming style with the dot format, and that's just that's just old habits dying hard. Um, so there's nothing wrong syntactically with this, and from an operational standpoint, it's going to take exactly the same amount of time. If you use one form rather than another, it's still incrementing it. So counter is now one, so my question is going to be, or my statement is counter one, is less than or equal to 10. That's true. So I'm going to come back in here. I'm going to print something out. I'm now going to alter that value again. Counter is about to become 2. I'm back up at the loop, at the top of the loop. I'm going to say 2 is less than or equal to 10. That's true. So I'm going to go back in here. And I'm just going to keep doing this until counter is 11. So let's go there. That's 9. This is 10. So counter is now 10. So 10 is less than or equal to 10. That's still true. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to print the statement out. I'm going to change counter to 11. So now 11 is less than or equal to 10. It's false. When that becomes false, you will notice the program ends because I don't go back into that loop. Now, I could have also said just print. So when I'm done with that loop, I would have gone to line 10. So if I run this again, you'll see all done with this loop. So if I change counter to 11, Will I actually get into that loop? The answer to that is no. I run it, and all I get is all done with the loop. And that's because when Python got here, it said 11 is less than or equal to 10. That's false. So it will never get in to this code block. So 
when the while statement is false, you do not get in to any of the code that is indented under the while. And by the way, the indenta indentation rules for loops are the same as the indentation rules for branches. They have to be indented one, and then if you're going to nest things, they have to be indented more. But for right now, this has to be indented one. By the way, if I don't indent this and I attempt to run it, I'm going to get indentation error, expected and indented block. So I'm always going to indent it. Now another thing I could do is this. Now the problem with this is this would be an infinite loop. Not going to, well, I will debug it. I'm not going to run it so I can, uh, I can stop it easier. I just created an infinite loop. Well, how do I know that? I know that because I just moved line 8 back so it's left justified with the while. So if I debug this, what you will see is, okay, I'm here, counter is 0, n is 10. I know that 0 is less than or equal to n. That's perfect. I'm going to print that out. And you'll notice I didn't hit line 8, and I printed out 0. And then I'm going to, it's going to say, well, counter is still less than, you know, 0 is still less than or equal to 10. I'm going to go back and I'm going to print something out, and it's still 0. Why is this happening? The only change that I made was to move this line and left justify it. That tells Python that this line is not part of the code block for the while loop. So it's never going to hit line 8 until this line, until counter, actually becomes greater than 10. Counter can never become greater than 10 because this line isn't part of the loop. So this is, in fact, an infinite loop. Zybooks will come back and say, time out there. PyCharm won't because Python doesn't know that I didn't mean to tell it to do this. Python thinks, okay, this is what she wants done, and it's just going to keep going. So the way to correct this is to make sure that everything is inside the loop that you need to be inside the loop. So 7 and 8 are inside the loop. 10 is outside the loop. If I accidentally make 8 outside the loop by just backspacing 1, I'm going to completely change the behavior of the program. So if you get timeout errors, if all of a sudden your while loops in PyCharm are going crazy, first of all, you can always hit the stop button, and it should hopefully work. Um, check what's inside the loop. So I'm going to keep going because I want to get to four loops. Um, and just to let you know, I generally don't use while loops for counting. I use for loops for counting. So we're going to see anybody. Any questions? Okay. So for loops. I use for loops more than I use while loops. I use for loops all the time because they're more convenient. You have to write less code. And most of the things that I deal with are finite sets. So it's a list. It's a dictionary. It's a string. So that's why I tend to use for loops. Now, for is a little different than while. And you will see that the construct is for variable in container. Um, and the container can be a string. The container can be a list. Um, the container can be lots of different things. But um, that is the construct. So rather than just a while and then like variable Boolean operator value, this is a little bit more complex, but it's really handy, and we'll find out next week how handy it is, because if I have a list, 
and I just want to roll through that list in a loop, all I have to do is say for, give it a variable that I haven't even defined yet, in and give it the list, and I'll just start running along. So um, here they've got um, an example for name in this list dot format name and what or sorry print high dot format name and we can actually do that and I can sh well let's go down and maybe do a challenge um, okay so that's for loops I think I want to do printing a list okay so here they're just saying sample output with inputs 34, 67, 630, and 8005. Okay. Um, so you're going to input a list, and then you're going to do a for loop, and you're going to output um, the, the price of, I guess, the stock. So let me do this. I'm going to create another one. Yeah. Python file. What challenge is this? Challenge four five one. Four five one. So basically, we're going to have a user. We'll just say stock price equals input um, split, comma. So, and we'll get more into this dot split stuff later. Just know for right now that if I'm inputting a list and it's comma separated then this is going to, uh, sorry, if I'm inputting into a program a comma-separated list, this is actually going to turn it into a true Python list. And then I'm going to say for price in stock price, print, So let's see what happens when I do this. So I have to edit the configuration. Okay. So challenge. Okay. So what's happening here? Well, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna debug this so that we can see what's happening. And what you'll see is it says enter stock prices. So I'm going to enter 10.11, uh, 12.13, and 14.15. Okay? So all this is in the list. It's 10.11, 12.13, and 13.15. So it's three entries. And it could have been any number. So what do I have here? Well, you'll see that my stock price is a list with three elements. 10.11, 12.13, and 14.15. That's great. So I want to now print out each of each price in that stock price list. Well, let's look at a few things here. First of all, I've got this variable price, but I haven't defined it like I had to with the while loop. With the while loop, I had to define that variable. In the for loop, I don't. For loop gives me the definition. It will assume that that variable is not, if, if it has not previously been defined, it's just going to define it for me. One of the reasons I like a for loop. Then I have this in here. In just says expect a collection. So expect like a list next, and if you have a list, then for each and every element in that list, uh, sorry about that, go away. For each and every element in that list, 
you will um, do something. And in this case, I'm just printing out the stock price. So here I'm going, I, I see that I've got these stock prices. And so I'm going to step over that. And I have price is 10.11. And I'm going to print out that. And then I come back up here. And right now it says price is 10.11. And I've still got my three things in the stock price. But Python knows that I already did the first thing in the list. It keeps that information for me. It's not something I have to do. Then it says, OK, well, the next element in the list is 12.13. It's going to print 12.13. And then it's going to say, OK, let's do this again. So now price is 14.15. And Python now knows that there's no more elements in the list that I have to act on. So it's going to be done. And this is what I get out. I must have had a space in there somewhere. So. That's what a for loop gives you that a while loop doesn't. Now, there are very good reasons to use a while loop. And as I said before, you will be using them in your projects. I tend to use for lists more than I do for loops more than I do while loops. So now there are other ways. Let's see. Range. Range is really nice. Range is a function that acts with using a for loop and it allows you to go from one number or from one yeah element to another element so you don't have to go through a whole list or um yeah so you don't have to go through a whole list you can if you want but you can also change the increment so in the previous example i had three things and i went one, I, I went through the, the 0, 1, and 2. Let me show you what I mean by that. OK. So we have a list. We know lists have indexes. So I'm just going to do this again. And instead, I'm going to say for um, lm in range 0, of stock price. OK, so this is something a little different that I'm doing. And, and I just want to show you the contrast of the two. So I have this, we've already seen this um, for loop where I just have price in, stock price. Well, maybe there's another way to go through this. And so let's do this again. I'm just going to debug it. And I'm going to uh, do, well, I don't do one. 10.11, okay, 10.11, 12.13, 14.15, and 15.16. So I'll just have four elements this time. So everything went through the first one. We can look at the console. Everything printed out just fine. So now I'm in the second loop. So let's take a look at what the second loop is showing us. Well, I'm going to have this, this thing called elem. And I've got this range function. Well, range says I'm going to start at index 0. And I'm going to go to 1 minus the length of the stock price. So my length of the stock price is 4. But I only want to go to index 3. So range is smart enough to know that. And it will only take me to index 3. That's what I do in this function. 
So let's step over this. Now we see that LM is int 0. Price, we don't have to worry about. It's back up here. And then the stock price has a list of four. And so when I step over this and I go to the console, I see stock price of zero is 10.11. So let's do this again. I'm back in the loop. Now you'll notice there's not a question being asked here. Like there was in the Y loop when we were saying, you know, counter is, you know, counter is zero and zero is less than or equal to 10, true or false. That's what we were doing in the while loop. In the for loop, we're not doing that. The for loop, we are just simply saying, okay, I've got a list. So all the elements in that list, I want to iterate over them because that's what we're doing. It's called iteration. So I know I'm comparing and contrasting the for and while loops because you're going to need to understand when to use which one as you're going through your projects. So I'm going to keep going through this one and you'll see as I go that it did all four and it, you know, Elm was the index and we were able to access whatever the, whatever it was in the list for stock price using that index. So that's where range comes in. And you're thinking, well, why did I need to do that? Well, because range does a few more things. Range allows you to skip stuff. Range allows you to say, you know, I don't care if the list has 100 things in it. I really only want to look at the first three. Or it says, um, I only want to look at, um, I only want to do every second integer from 0 to 4. So that's what this one would be. So you would be doing 0, 2, and 4. So you wanted to skip over things. Maybe you only wanted to look at the even um, at, at the even elements in a list. Or maybe you wanted to go backwards. So here you can go backwards. 5, 0, minus 1. So let's look at that. So let's go backwards. So I'm going to say, because it's that kind of night, backwards. Okay. So I'm just going to copy this guy. And I'm going to say range from len of stock price. So I'm going to start at the, the highest one to zero, and I'm going to count backwards. So here, I should be starting, if I did the same list, I should be starting at three. I should be going to two, zero, two, one, and zero, if I can count backwards. So let's see what happens. I'm not going to do this guy. I'm going to set my breakpoint here and I'm going to debug. So we're going to do 10.11, 12.13, 13.14, and 15.16. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 this time. So I'm here and I have for alum in range and I'm going to go from the length of stock price to the, la the, the first element. So I'm going backwards, minus 1. So let's see if I did this right. Okay? So LM is 5, and there are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. There's going to be a problem. I'm going to about to get an index out of bounds. Oh, no, I didn't. No, I did get an index out of range. So my bad here, when it is the first number in the range, I have to add a minus one. So what happened? Len of stock price here is five. So the length of stock price was five. And what, um, 
sorry, what the, here, I'll show you again. So why did it get an in, index out of bounds? So let's go. And I'm going to do this. Okay, so here I am, and I am at LM is 4, the price is that, and I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. However, I am, this is 0, That this is the index of 0, index of 1, index of 2, index of 3, index of 4. So len of stock price is going to give me 5. And unlike this one, which is the second argument in range, because range is smart enough to know if it's the second argument it's minus one, this doesn't the the range when you have the len of stock price here as the first argument, range does not know to take that minus one off. So if you're going backwards and you're using range and len, you have to say minus one here. And is this clear? Have I just made it like clear as mud for you guys? Okay. So we're going to do this one more time. And I'm going to say 10, 11, 11, 12, 12, 13, 14, 14, 15. So we'll just do that. Okay. And... So now I'm here and I have len of stock price minus 1. So that's going to mean I'm at 4. So I'm going to go here and I have a list that's 5 long, but LM here is 4. And so I'm not going to get an index out of bounds. And lo and behold, I'm starting at 4 again. Okay, so if I do this, I'm now going to go 3 two, one, and I'm done. So this is how I would go backwards using range. So you'll notice I didn't really change that much. Okay, I didn't have to write a lot of extra code. I didn't have to count backwards in a while loop. I just changed what was in my range function. So this is one of another reason why I like for loops in Python. Um, they can be very, very handy, and you can write less code. Get used to range. Range is very handy, and um, you can do a lot of things with it. Um, so let's go. We've done a lot. I'm not going to go over this. We've talked a lot about while and for. Nested loops. You can have a loop within a loop. You can have a while loop in a for loop and a for loop in a while loop. Everything still applies. Um, why would you want to, I'm not going to go through the nested while loops. Why would you want to have a loop inside of a loop? You would want to have a loop inside of a loop be in, in the real world because you're going over a matrix. If you think about a spreadsheet with rows and columns, and I'm thinking about this now because we're going to do this next week, you are going to have to have a loop inside of a loop to get to the actual values. So um, so here's, you know, I'm not going to go through this one, but you're just going to have a loop inside of a loop, and you're going to have, um, yeah, you're going to have a loop inside of a loop here. You're going to have a number of rows and a number of columns, and you're going to loop over the rows and columns. So, and I'm asking you guys right now, is there any particular challenge or lab you want me to look at tonight. So we talked about this developing uh, programs in incrementally, sorry. Um, and just a reminder, the last two labs. Okay, we can do that, Chris. So we'll take a look at those. Break and continue. Okay. So remember we were talking a little bit about um, infinite loops? 
there is a way to break out of a loop and there is a way to continue. So if you have branches inside loops, it's because you want to do something different. So you can break and you can continue. Break says stop and exit the loop, whatever loop I'm in. Um, continue says don't do anything after this, go back to the top of the loop. That's what those two do and they are used to control what's going on in a loop. Okay, because sometimes you just don't want to do anything else or sometimes you know that you're just done. You've got to stop at this point. So that's what break and continue do. Um, so let's just loop else. I don't use loop else. You guys do your challenges and stuff, but I've never actually, I, I understand the concept. I can program to it. It's not something I use in my daily life. Um, getting both index and value when looping using the enumerate function. Um, yeah, I enumerate is great. I don't necessarily, again, it's probably because I'm a little bit old school that I don't use enumerate. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. It, um, yeah. Origins is what? Yeah, it's just a list. So I and and again, don't let my prejudices keep you from trying anything. Um, this is just additional practice, counting input lengths. Okay, so this is a lab. Is this one of the ones? Password modifier. That's a fun one. And drawing a right triangle. Okay, and then Mad Lib loops. So, okay. So let's go back and we'll do, we'll start these two. We'll start 4.15 and 4.16 or 4.16 and 4.17. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about 4.16. So we'll get these started as usual. I'm not going to complete them, but um, no. Come on. No. Not running. Oh. Okay. Okay. Just checking. Trying to figure out what's wrong and why I can't create a new Python file. There we go. Python file. Lab 4.16. Okay. So let's see what 4.16 is talking about. You want to output a right triangle on a user specified height and symbol. So um, it's going to have a fixed height triangle with a star character. Modify the given program to output a right triangle that instead uses a user specified character. That's number one. Number two, modify the program to use a loop to output a right triangle of the height, triangle height. The first line will be one user specified character such as percent or star. Each subsequent line will have one additional user specified character until the number in the triangle's base reaches the triangle height. Output a space after each user specified character, including the line's last user specified character. Okay. They could have made that a little bit more difficult. Example for triangle care and height is five. So the care is percent, it's going to be percent and then per percent space, percent space, percent space, percent. So it'll go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. That makes a little more sense. So I'm going to have two inputs. I'm going to have height and I'm going to say care, care equals
Okay. So let's do this just in baby steps. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to height. I'm going to make sure this is an integer. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do while I'm programming this is I'm going to just do a for loop. I'm going to say for um, whoops, writing Java. So in this case, I'm still going to use a for loop because I like them better. For counter less than height uh, and then I'm going to just print counter is Okay, so what's wrong here? Can't assign. Hmm? I'm not doing an assignment. For counter. Nope. Okay. Really didn't like that for loop. Of course, I've been writing Java today, so. I apologize if I'm getting my languages mixed up. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to run this program after I change my configuration. Okay, so we're going to do this challenge. So first of all, I'm just going to run this. We're going to see what we get out. Okay, enter. Whoops, not doing the right thing. Okay. So, edit configuration, I am, okay, oh, wait a minute, my bad. It's doing exactly what I told it to do, and I told it to do the wrong thing. All right, so let's run this, just see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to input 5, and I'm going to input a character dollar sign. Okay, and so I did something wrong. What did I do wrong here? Anybody want to tell me what I just did wrong? I didn't increment it. I was thinking for loop, but I put a while loop. So I got counter is zero, height is five, forever. And I did a keyboard interruption, so I stopped it. So now let's run this again and see what happens. Okay, come on. There we go. So I'm going to say five here. And I'm going to do a dollar sign. And now I get counter is zero, height is five, counter is one, two, three, four. So now I have gone through the loop five times. I've iterated through the loop five times. So now, instead of doing this, I think what I'm going to print out is I'm going to print out my care. And I'm going to have to the end equal quote space. So I'm adding a space at the end without having to do a lot of extra work. So let's run it again. So I'm going to put five, and I'm going to put dollar sign, and I get five dollar signs out. Well, that's great. That's not what I wanted, but that's great. So how do I now get what I want? Well, the first thing I have to do is realize I have to have a second loop, because I'm not just going in one direction. I'm going in two. I'm going up and down and left and right. Actually, I'm going right because it's a right triangle, and down. 
So I have to have two loops because I'm doing two different directions. So this is my outer loop, and I'm going to have an inner loop, okay? And I'm going to have while inner less than height, well, less than or equal to counter. Oops. And I'm going to do this here. And then I'm going to print. Okay. Equal. And then I'm going to say. Whoops. Inner plus one. So let's see what happens when I run this. And then we'll probably leave it like this, and you guys can fix it. I'm not going to be perfect yet. So I'm going to make my height 5, and I'm going to make this my character. And I still didn't get it right. And I didn't get it right because I got the right number of them. But I didn't... Um, Yeah, I need to do a new line, and I don't need to do this print statement. That print statement doesn't need to be there. Okay, so I actually have the right number of them, but I have to make sure that when I go back up, so this is inner is less than or equal to counter, and then I have to print a new line. Let's see what happens. I just want to see. Okay, so that wasn't right either. So, sorry. It wasn't in the right place. Now, this is not the most efficient way to do this. But then we'll go on to the other one. Okay, so you have a right triangle now. So, this is not the real solution. You guys are going to have to go in and you're going to have to make the code a little bit more efficient. But this is basically what you need to do. Okay? And the, the reason I went through the whole thing is because I really did want to show you multiple loops. So you have an outer loop and an inner loop. Okay? The inner loop um, is where you're doing the printing. But the outer loop is controlling, so the outer loop is controlling the height. Okay, and the inner loop is controlling the width. So that's what you're doing here. So I probably went a little too far and I shouldn't have, but okay, I'm not going to worry about it now. So let's do the Mad Lib loops. So this will be lab 4.17. Let's do a new, and I won't go, why does it keep doing that? Okay. So we'll do another Python file, lab 417. Okay. So let's take a look at 4.17, and it said Mad Libs are activities that have a person provide various words, which are then used to complete a short story in an unexpected and hopefully funny ways. Write a program that takes a string and an integer as input and outputs a sentence using those items as below. The program repeats until the user string is quit. Example, if the input is Apple 5, choose 2, quit zero, it should say, eating five apples a day keeps the doctor away. Eating two shoes a day keeps the doctor away. And when you say quit, it stops. So here's a couple of key things to, to look at. When it says the program repeats until the input string is quit, 
or in this case, until the input string is. This means you're going to use a while loop. Okay, if you're modifying the loop, the control of the loop, by user input, then in fact, you're going to be using a while loop. So, uh, and we're going to say, eating blank, blank, a day keeps the doctor away. Eating blank, blank, keeps the doctor away. So, it's is very similar to the while loop we did here on the simple while loop. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, let's see, while stop, it looks very much like we just did before, stop equal go, while stop, not equal to quit, And what's it going to be? It's going to be uh, user input. And this is where that split function comes in handy again. So basically, I'm asking them to enter a word and a number, and I'm going to split it up and turn it into a list. So user input is going to be a list. And then I'm going to print, and I'm not going to do the whole print statement. You guys are going to have to figure that out. I'm going to say uh, word is, and then number is. of one. Okay? And I'm just going to keep doing this until I say quit. Zero. Oh, what do we, No, we're good. So let's see what happens when I run this. Okay, please enter a word and a number. Lisa29. And then it's going to ask me again. And I'm going to put Apple 3. And then it's going to ask me again, and I'm going to put quit zero. And it didn't work. Word is quit, number is zero. Well, stop. Ah! <laughs> okay. I just created another infinite loop because I wasn't thinking. Stop is going to be equal to user input of zero. So let me do this again. And run it. So we're going to say Lisa 29. We're going to say Apple 3. And we're going to say December. I can. December 23. BEC. And then I'm going to say quit and zero. And I stop. So this is similar to what you're going to have to do. This is a single while loop. We take user input. The user input is going to use to alter the processing of the loop. So that's what's important here. And when you get this right, you'll, you will understand how better to deal with your program. So does anybody else have any questions tonight? So if we're all good, I'm going to call it at 1018, and um, I will put this up, and I'll put the scripts up as well. So um, you guys have a good evening. No problem, Ingrid. I'm glad I can be of help.